Welcome to a special episode of Cosmic Road today. We are joined by the famous UFO whistleblower, Michael Herrera. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Hey, thank you for having me on, man. I know we've been talking about this for a while now, but it's good to finally get on your show. And uh, as well as your supporters, keep supporting people like Jack, please. Jack, among other people doing a summer thing, they are actually focused on getting the truth out. I don't talk to mainstream media for obvious reasons. I refuse. I've had, when I came out with my testimony, um, I've had literally hundreds of people from mainstream hit me up and I denied every single one of them. So I refuse to work in mainstream. Jack, it's people like you that are really making a difference. You're not bought, you're not paid for. You're actually committed to getting the truth out. And that's why your your channel is doing wonders as far as getting information out. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Uh, most of you guys are aware of Mike's story and his, his amazing encounter in Indonesia uh, but for the, and he's got some new information. I think it's going to be really mind blowing information, but for those of us who haven't studied your previous encounter in Indonesia, can you give us a quick breakdown of that? Sure. So I was the United States Marine Corps. Um, I was attached to the seventh fleet with the, which at least had the 31st Marine Expeditionary unit out in Southeast Asia. So being into that unit, um, Typically, what you're going to have to face is usually some sort of security maritime operations or humanitarian aid. Uh, sometimes there's conflict, but it kind of depends on the scenarios with that. So um, you have to be really trained for kind of every scenario. But most of the time, with my experience, it was humanitarian assistance. So being a part of 7th Fleet, which also patrols out in Southeast Asia, there was actually a typhoon that hit the Philippines. So 7th Fleet went to go um, handle that operation. My ship, which was the USS Denver, was rerouted all the way to the western side of uh, Indonesia, which was Padang City, which got ravaged, I believe, by a 7.2 or 7.6 earthquake that happened um, late September. So we got there early October. And uh, we were the first Marines off the ship um, with weapons, of course, because Indonesia is the second largest terrorist capital in the world. They train a lot of forces out there. So anybody who wants a PC United States, they will go there for training. They will send them all the way up to the Middle East or wherever they want and uh, basically try to put their skills to use. So um, we were basically tasked with securing the uh, Hasty LZ, which is basically a not planned uh, landing zone. And uh, basically as a Marine or anybody who's in a tactical situation, you always want to take the top ground or the high ground, right? Because you can see everything you can see especially if you're on a top point you can see 30 360 degrees if it if it's a perfect world so our thinking is okay let's push to the slope and that's when we basically turned around and on down the slope there was this thing just sitting there and it was changing color so you know if you have the trees we can only see this much of it right but you can see it moving so we all looked at each other like okay it's the kind of a weird building or whatever it is and we end up patrolling down and we see this craft sitting here, and as we're getting closer on level with uh, coming down this slope and onto the uh, where this opening was coming up to, um, we just see this entire thing that you know I estimate was 300 feet in diameter. Because typically, as a marine, you're very good with assessing distances and how to measure things, especially with optics. Which, of course, we weren't planning on weapons at it, but we were intercepted by a team of eight. Um, Come to find out they're, they're contractors, former special operations these days. I mean, there's more information that's been coming out, um, especially with some of the sources I've been coordinating with. We were held at gunpoint. They had four on each side like this. We were in the middle. So they had pretty much interlocking fields of fire, if you can imagine, like this. So they had all these muzzles on us. They had us. Um, they had to drop on us first. And uh, they, pursued it. they proceeded to basically threaten us, tell us that they could kill us. They could, you know, it's very easy to get lost out here in the jungle. Um, we could smoke you right now. I mean, they were saying pretty much not the nice things that anybody would want to hear, especially when you're doing humanitarian missions. You're not really expecting any kind of uh, resistance or any kind of operation like that. Now, that sounds terrifying. It, it was. It wasn't, it wasn't fun by any means, you know. And we had, so there were six of us. There was eight of them, so we're outnumbered by two. They already had the drop on us. I always get people who said, okay, well, that one, no, first of all, you're in our shoes. You wouldn't have done anything, just like we weren't able to do anything either. I don't, people watch John Wick or play these video games and think that they've got this, you know, you can raise a weapon already from a low ready while you have already people focused and aiming at you. Already, you could, you know, it was so 
so in tune with you with your senses because of everything going on that you could audibly hear them flip the safeties off of their weapons. It was it was it was crazy. So in this commotion, we're being searched. They have uh, you know at a standoff distance, so they're probably about ten feet away. Because you know if you get close to somebody, you could grab a weapon, push it off to the side, do whatever it is. And uh, they were off at a standoff distance while they had two of their guys searching us. Um, they took our weapons from us. They cleared them, make sure that we had no rounds in the chamber. They dumped our magazines out of our uh, magazine pouches, kicked them off towards the guy that was actually off at a distance so we couldn't run and go grab them or kind of load our weapons or anything like that. So uh, they took our military IDs. They, uh, one by one, they were going through all of our stuff. Um, before we even went to that point, I actually had pictures and videos I've taken of this thing. And we have a dump pouch that typically what you do is retain your magazines. You put it in the dump pouch um, because you're not going to drop them because you reuse the same magazines every time you, you load out and uh, prep for either a patrol or something like that. So I stuck it in there. They never searched the dump pouch, which was weird. So the whole time that this is going on, I have in the back of my mind, like, oh, my God, I got video and, and photographic evidence of, of this, this thing. Right. And um so as that's going on, they get through searching us. They tell us to face the hill. So, um, you know, going back and forth between having these guys hold you up, you're also taking note of what's going on in the background, which is this craft. And this craft is floating uh, 15, 20 feet off the ground, and it's rotating in a clockwise motion. It has like an, it's an octagonal shape because you can see kind of where the color, or not the color, but the uh, corner and the edges are. And you can see how it was rotating that you, you know, and made this octagon shape, at least if you're looking at it from the side. Classic kind of saucer type, but more rough edge. It had this pyramid on the top that I remember distinctly because as it's rotating, the sun's hitting it in certain ways to kind of darken the shade in some areas. So you can kind of see what that look, you know, if you can imagine what a dark side of a pyramid would look like as it's rotating, that's what kind of, that's what it reminded me of. So I'm, I'm without a doubt think that was some sort of pyramid structure on the top that they were, that they had. And I don't know what the purpose of it is, but it was floating above this platform and this platform, they had these trucks that were basically coming at us and then they were driving away from us to go under this craft. And the trucks looked like uh, Ford F-350s that were matte black. They had no insignias on them, just like the military guys that we ran into. Um, they had no insignias, they had no rank, nothing that would signify. The only thing, the reason why I knew they were American, because they had similar weapon systems to what we had, but newer stuff. And they had American gear, uh, such as similar IOTB vests, which is our bulletproof vests with sappies in them. They were speaking to us in perfect English, how you and I speak, Jack. They sound... Very similar. They had. No I don't know if my them. English is perfect, but thank you. <laughs> Compared to what some people think, because I've had people ask me if they had uh, Australian accents, if they had Eastern European, if they were Russian, German. I mean, no, they were American. And um, so these trucks were coming up and they were driving away from us. And they had these containers that they were hauling on this trailer. And these containers looked like small black shipping containers that had a cylinder that was actually on the top part, but on the front. So where the truck was, it had this, you know, imagine if this is the box right here, the cylinder was right here, and here's like the truck. So we saw, I only count seeing four of those trucks with that similar um, tow package, if you will, and it had some a um, Pelican cases in the truck beds, at least two of them that I could see that looked like weapons cases. So they were driving these trucks onto this platform. We're going between, you know, obviously, them searching us. So, you know, because obviously we have guns pretty much pointed at us with people we don't know who the hell they are on the top of the fact that you have this craft sitting there. And then you have these trucks that are, you know, driving under this onto this platform. And I never saw them unload anything onto the platform um, because obviously going back and forth. But all I recall seeing is obviously these guys, this craft, um, in these trucks with these containers that had a cylinder on it, which I assumed was HVAC, um, which ended up being correct. My hypothesis when I went to Arrow uh, last year in uh, April 27th, to be more specific, is when I had that appointment with them. And that's when I met Dr. K and some other people that I can't mention, but I know how you guys feel about Dr. K. Trust me, it's a mutual feeling. Especially He's my favorite person. What are you talking about? 
<laughs> yeah, considering that he has handlers that are telling him what he should look into and what to do, right? You know, um, I know some of other people who've went to Arrow um, that have given him and that team solid evidence of where certain exotic materials are located, what sectors they are, who's responsible for overseeing those operations, and they have yet to look into any single one of those, but you want to know what they're interested in looking for. Something like uh, uh, Commander Fravor, for example, when they want to investigate the Tic Tac that they can't, you know, you can't go up in the sky and go look for it right now. They'll spend more resources to look on that stuff compared to the logistics side where you actually have physical proof stored at. All right. So that kind of tells you, you know, like it's almost like, OK, we're going to look for a bird carrying drugs instead of going to the crack house where they're making the drugs and busting the people there. They want to look for that pigeon. Well, let's yeah. look for the bird where the bird was 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Know. Exactly. So it's it's just kind of like when you're seeing him come out and saying that nobody's given him anything tangible as well as that department. It's just it's it's disgusting. Were you able to provide any of that video footage that you're talking about? No, um, and the reason being is because when we went to the Philipp went back to the Philippines right after that operation, so they let us go. They escorted us up the hill. They couldn't, you know, after we see, of course, this, you know, platform merges with the craft, craft raises above the tree line, and it shoots off to our left, which is where the ocean was, right? So uh, the craft made no noise, uh, just sound like a transformer noise or some audible hum, like a... Um, the other way I can describe it is like a guitar amp, but not the same. It's something very similar to that. It's not the exact same pitch. Um, but it took off instantaneously uh, around thousands of miles per hour, and it looked like a black bird. It didn't leave any kind of exhaust uh, notes or anything that would disturb the trees, like water wash. There was coconuts on these trees that we can see, and none of them were disturbed. Not one. So no sonic boom, nothing like that. It's like it just... Whatever it interacts with the environment, it didn't do any of that. It just was like in its own area, and that's all it was concerned with. It's 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 very eerie to see. It's it's something that's very creepy because you would think something that fast and that big was to generate a, enough force to leave that fast that you would leave some sort of sound, and it didn't do any of that. It's, so was it, it like warping space and time and like a bubble around it? Do you have any no. notion of how it was operating? I have, I mean, there's some theories I've heard from some people who are involved with uh, some of these programs, but um, even they're more perplexed about it these days, just because um, some of the stuff that they've seen that's readily available to them um, even is on level with extraterrestrial and NHI technology. Like they, they're almost having a problem trying to distinguish both of them. That's how good that they've gotten these ships and any materials for the matter like that, um, as far as reverse engineering. Well, James Lukaski, I, I don't want to get off on a, a tangent, but he was recently talking about how OSAP was observing these objects that at first they thought were black ops, you know, UFOs, uh, to use the term, ARVs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but ultimately they realized they were genuine NHI uh, craft, uh, mm -hmm. but they had a hard time distinguishing between the two. Yep. And, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, when they had these, because that's when a lot of the research was going on into developing stuff that was replicated to act the same way. And that, you know, um, I'm sure a lot of people may not be aware of Operation Paperclip when they pulled a lot of the Nazi scientists. A lot of those scientists, because they were working on stuff such as reverse engineering in Germany. A lot of people don't know that. Um, there were, General Patton was another person who went over there to actually go look at some stuff, along with uh, Senator Warner, because he talked to his son in D.C., and uh, he kind of told everybody what his dad told him. His dad was actually a part of a Majestic 12 um, panel that was overseeing this stuff, so there are some things that he kind of mentioned with that, which is, which is ironic, because my background, I didn't believe in any of this stuff. I thought it was just something that made good movies. I didn't think anything of it. It was just, you know, frankly, some of the movies when I was a kid scared the crap out of me. So I'm like, okay, this doesn't exist. I'm good for that. You know, that would be a hell of a hell of a life to live if this stuff existed. Well, come to 2009 and seeing stuff like this, it answered two things for me. One, that we had that kind of capability and that technology, but two, we also got it from something that obviously is not uh, of this world. At least in our understanding, who knows? They could have been here at one point before we were and traveled out. Or you know, there's so many different theories. It's amazing. Do you think this so, technology that we were able to use came from paperclip, or do you think it came from reverse engineering Roswell or some other crash? 
Both, both because they use those scientists to actually um, study those materials and, and actually put their heads together to actually come up with some good stuff. So a lot of the scientists, at least back in the 50s 60s, and 60s, were a part of Operation Paperclip. In these black programs specifically, you had some that obviously went to more of the blue team assets like NASA creating the CIA, which the CIA, the Air Force, were created at the same time during the National Security Act that was signed in 1947. Um, by President Truman at that time. So um, as far as the camera situation of what I had, we actually went back to after this debacle happened, which all of us were freaked out, uh, which still are to this day. I don't blame them for that. I have a lot of uh, blowback from some of these guys that I still talk to because they don't want any of this to come forward. And I don't blame them because being in the spotlight in this sense, especially on this subject, is not any fun. It's not supposed to be. This is something that needs to get out because there has been other instances where this has been um, very, very negative stuff that has gotten a lot of innocent people killed and even people and, and prominent people for the matter who have lost their lives looking into this subject. Our species as, as mankind could be so further along uh, with the help of this technology. And who knows if we're at a higher level of consciousness, there may be a point where we could actually have as normal citizens here um, interaction with uh, non-human intelligence. That would probably be the thing that would also elevate everybody because you're learning something outside of our world. Maybe these beings know more about our history than we do. Maybe they're they maybe they can teach us about something like that. You know, so it's it's interesting to see how this will play out. But going back to the camera issue, we were on our ship. We pulled into Subic Bay. We were there for four days, but we had to come back to the ship every night because they don't let you stay out in town if you're deployed like that. And um, the first day that we went out, you know, we got, we had fun, you know, trying to blow off everything. We didn't, you know, a lot of us, we didn't hang out with each other after that fact, you know, only a couple of us did, but we didn't talk about it for years. You know, it was just something that we just tried to forget and um, came back to the ship that night and my camera, which was actually secured in my locker, which had a lock on it. The lock had no damage. I don't know how they got into it, but that camera was sitting on top of my rack and that memory card was pulled out and that battery was pulled out and where I had that camera I had a bunch of my stuff on top of it in my locker and I had another battery to it just in case and I went to put in a new battery and it wouldn't even turn off so my camera was sabotaged the stuff was taken out of it nobody knows to this day how that happened I don't know um, I just think it's ironic the fact that that, along with all these other guys that were with me, the other five other Marines, their phones were missing too. So um, that was something that kind of like, well, okay, so obviously they knew who we were um, because they took our military IDs, took pictures of them with these things that you know look like a modern day smartphone compared to what they had back then. And so that was a little bit disheartening because I had pictures and videos of this, of this damn thing. And... That it, could it have done any kind of, um, what do you want to call it? Um, I wouldn't say confirmation because, you know, a lot of these days there's people who take videos and pictures of the real thing and people, you know, it's hard to believe. It's hard to see if, okay, maybe it's been manipulated some way to, with CGI to make it look like it's a craft or something like that. There's a lot of good people who know how to do that kind of stuff. So I don't know if that was to have came out. Um, if it would have actually validated anything that I've talked about. So it's just kind of a what if theory. Um, I don't know how people would have taken that, but it just, it would have been weird. So the new information guys, um, since I came forward, uh, um, April, May, June timeframe, I did a disclosure 2.0 event with Dr. Stephen Greer and I did the national press club. So in my shoes, there was nobody else that I could go to. I don't know anybody talking about this stuff that was pulling people um, to have them meet with the Pentagon among with other people. So I had, I, um, Dr. Greer came to Colorado. I had talked to him in 2017. Um, he was doing some events. So I kind of wanted to see what his stuff was about. And uh, he was doing some book signings after he gave his presentation. So I bought a book, which was unacknowledged. And that's when I told him I had some stuff to tell him. And he kind of looked at me like, okay, you know, whatever. But then I kind of hinted some things and he's like, he forgot everybody else. He stood up and I didn't realize how tall this guy was, 
which kind of caught me off guard. But um, he gave me his card, and told me not to get, you know, give it to anybody that, you know, no, don't leak his information out, which I respect. But um, and then I didn't really do anything with it because, again, being under an NDA from this as well, from somebody who was an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who served us paperwork, um, NDAs, um, after that event when we were back in Japan, um, obviously we weren't going to talk about it. Now then they put the National, National Defense Authorization Act, when they put that through the spending bills anyway, to allow anybody with the subject to come forward in a legal means without having repercussions, especially, you know, me, I don't know if there's anything with illegal with it because you had guys that were outfitted with, with high speed stuff. Maybe it could have been a military operation at one point is what I was thinking, something that may have been top secret, you know, so there's, there's a lot of gray areas that, you know, you could start thinking about. So after they passed that, of course, that's when I contacted Dr. Greer and told him pretty much everything that I have came out forward and talked about. Um, now, when I gave my testimony to the Pentagon or Arrow, I met with the Senate Intelligence Committee prior to that. I met with the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, members, at least in the SCIF at, um, in DC on Capitol Hill, and the Special uh, Intelligence Service, which also integrates and overlooks all the letter agencies like CIA, FBI. So I talked to all those head people. The thing I liked about doing that before going to Arrow was I gave them everything that I knew, um, that I experienced, and then they took me over to Arrow to do the same thing in their skiff that they had there. And the reason why they chose to do that was because it's more of an ability to try to hold Arrow accountable because you have all these people, which including some senators and politicians that I've spoken to as well, who have um, had interest in this. So they were more along the lines trying to hold Arrow accountable as well. And everybody knows since last year how that went. Well, so I'm really glad some people are trying to hold Arrow accountable. Um, yep. Yeah. Any inside word on how that's going? Uh, I have not heard anything. I was supposed to get some images from uh, the Pentagon as far as trying to get some satellite imagery of that day. And they haven't they haven't got back to me about that. Oh, yeah. Satellite imagery of that incident. That'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, they probably way, had it. They could. I mean, you know, coming, have, learning about what's going on now at least with these handlers and how they're integrated into everything and trying to get the right reports, at least for them to look into. Right. Um, so it's disappointing. It's disappointing because there are situations like this that have happened where people have lost their lives and it's not even people, military personnel, there's military personnel. I mean, this, this is something that's worldwide. It's not something that just stuck to the United States. For example, this impacts a lot of people worldwide. Do you know of specific uh, incidents of that? Um, not that I can personally confirm, but I have been told that there's been similar instances. I don't know the time frames. I don't know the dates. I don't know the locations. But what I experienced was not one of the only thing. This has happened throughout the years. So there's people in this in this community, even in the government, who've known about stuff like this to happen, which is mind blowing. Because you figure if they know what's going on, then maybe they can. There's a way that they can curb this to actually do something beneficial instead of potentially getting people killed or threatened or anything like that, any kind of negative consequences. So, um, you know, segueing back into the event with Dr. Greer, um, not knowing anybody else who was in this issue that was able to bring anybody forward, that's why I chose him. Yeah, um, well, I give Dr. Greer a lot of flack, but he has done a lot of good also. And he has been a force for good in the community, uh, you know, uh, as much as I have troubles with him sometimes. Uh, but he's brought a lot of great witnesses and, and whistleblowers like yourself forward. And uh, and, and thank you so much to, for your courage for coming out with this. Uh, I know this hasn't been easy. No, it hasn't, you know, but everybody needs to know the truth and the truth needs to come out. And it's just something that I'm tired of people, you know, there's people making money off the secrecy. That's just how this works. There's people doing very illegal shit with this. And part of my French, but I'm, it kind of angers me a little bit because the fact that, you know, there's a lot of money being spent in this. There's people who are in the government who know what's going on that are bought by these aerospace companies that are overseeing this stuff because the government doesn't do it. And the only reason why is because these privatized companies are immune to FOIA requests. That's what they hide under that guise. If it was a government program, you could actually, as a person, put a FOIA request in, 
start knocking on some of these guys' doors in Washington, D.C. to try to get some answers from this. And they legally have to tell you certain parameters of it, such as if it exists or anything like that, or the tax dollars that are going to funding this mechanism, whatever they're creating. So they have the actual budgets, then they have the actual black budget, which everybody knows is the stuff that's for the top secret uh, projects that are overseen in the legal manners of Congress, the Senate, the president, even if he's read into certain aspects with that. Um, but for the most part, these guys in these aerospace companies will tell the government that, uh, for example, a B-2 Spirit stealth bomber costs $2 billion. In reality, it doesn't even cost nearly anything like that. It costs way less than that, but what they do is they siphon that money, build it into stuff that they're actually using, such as this technology that's off the books that nobody has an idea of. There's no paper trail into it. And they have things accounted for that they do, such as you know documentation, scrubbing documents for that matter, or altering or falsifying documents to say that everything went to this project when that wasn't the case. This has come from people that I've spoken to who are in these companies that are a part of this organization that is around this issue, such as the UAP uh, UFO phenomenon. So when I did Dr. Greer's event, I did a presentation on his event before the press club. It was June uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th, I believe, was the press club event, which was the last day that I was there. So I presented on the 10th and uh, told people in his audience among you know, his uh, web sources or anything for his webcam audience um, what I experienced. My hypothesis on those containers I saw in those trucks was drugs. It's the only thing that made sense to me because I had an HVAC system, something either to vacuum seal or to oxygenate to keep it fresh. However, they're moving this stuff, obviously, with this craft. When I gave that presentation, I was also running uh, with some other gentleman that we hired uh, as armed security for him because he got a little paranoid. And I don't blame him because there's been some instances that happened working with him during those days that people have tried to touch him, grab him or, you know, inflict harm. So he definitely risks himself uh, having personally seen that. <clears throat> so we had an armed guy that was permitted to be armed. I have a private security firm, but my credentials do not go to Washington, D.C. So if I'm caught with a, a armed, I can go to prison. So I'm not risking any of that. Um, they have different laws, different stipulations that you have to follow in there. This guy already had his credentials. So it was just a no brainer. So they hired him and he was with us, but I was also helping with security. So after I presented, uh, Dr. Greer went to go take a break. So we went back to his green room and he got a text message. And he got a text message from somebody that has been working with him, um, giving him information, documents, locations, things, because this guy's an insider. And it's not just him. There's a group of these individuals in the same organization. This particular gentleman sends him a text message that's like a Bible right? It's just length. The first thing he says is, I do not want to leave Michael hanging on what he saw, but what he saw was not drugs in those containers. That's not what they're used for. They're used for humans. And he put, he didn't put exactly why, but that's why he wanted to talk to Dr. Greer about that incident, uh, because his particular role, some of these guys, they actually guard those containers when they're using these operations. So he knew exactly what I saw. I had no idea it was humans. And when I heard that and saw that, because he handed me his phone and I read this, my heart sunk. Because here we are to an extent that potentially could we have done something? I don't know. I don't know if it was just the eight guys or if there could have been 30 of those guys that, that ran this operation. Obviously, we would have opened fire. We would have, we would have gotten killed, especially knowing what these guys' backgrounds are, are, are especially. So... Um, being in a helpless situation where you know there's people being taken aboard for these programs, it really, 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 uh, I mean, I, I cried when I saw that because I wasn't thinking that. And uh, my wife was with me and he, you know, Dr. Greer kind of cried a little bit too. And he says, I've heard of things like this. He says, but it's never been confirmed from insiders who are a part of this organization. So um, that is very disturbing. It is. And I was thinking, you know, worst case scenario with this. So they're harvesting people. What are they doing with these people? I mean, you know, I've heard stuff with Hollywood with those conspiracies or whatnot, but it wasn't something that was like I was thinking about. It just didn't register to me. And then when that was said, 
by people involved in this organization that they've done these operations like this numerous times, especially these guys have been in this organization since the 90s. You know, so they've done this for a very long time. Some of these guys are very high up in this organization, so they get a well-rounded view of certain things. It's still compartmentalized, and this is their words, you know, so they don't know everything of this, for example, but what they're involved with, this spans a big uh, range of things. So um, that's when I came on to uh, the National Press Club, and that's when I told people it was human. So there's a distinction. People saw that I said this drugs, which is true, but then being corrected by these people who work in these organizations who have done operations like that are telling me that it's humans. So um, I was not happy about it. It completely flipped my world upside down. I couldn't sleep for a number of days after that because of just my mind was just going a million miles a second. So uh, fast forwarding, you know, I didn't think much was going to happen with this, to tell you the truth. I thought I was going to do the press club event, uh, Dr. Greer's event, and now to Bennett. Uh, there have been, of course, people that tried to get interviews. Sean Ryan was actually in attending that event as well as the press club. So he invited me onto a show. So I did that. I didn't think that this was going to go as far as, it, as it's gone. And it's because people, for one, they can't believe it. My personal view, um, having been involved with this, having witnessed this, it seems kind of more normal compared to somebody saying that they've actually encountered ETs and were taken above a craft. I'm not discounting that by any means. There are people I know who've had experiences like that um, very genuinely, um, which were positive for the most part. Granted, you know, what our interpretation of negative may not be pop, may not be negative to these beings or whatever. It may be positive to them. We don't have the understanding that they have. So it's more of kind of teaching these people who, you know, if they're having any kind of interaction with these beings. So um, that sounds more unbelievable and more uh, otherworldly, no, no pun intended, compared to what I experienced. Um, so a lot of people can't believe it. And to this day, um, yeah, I can't believe it either because the fact of this going on and then other people all of a sudden from this organization that does it are helping me with information and trying to set the thing, the right tone for the world to know. And a lot of them have went to the government behind closed doors to talk to them about what I experienced because I was the first one to come forward in this issue related to what they were doing. So um, July timeframe, Dr. Greer sent me a message and gave me this gentleman's information. Didn't really tell me his name, but he gave me his phone number, said, this is a gentleman that saw, that knows exactly what you saw. And this is the one that sent the message. So he says, go ahead and contact him. He wants to read you in and tell you some things. So I sat on it for a day because I'm like, here's the horse's mouth. You know, that's, it's kind of frightening because my last interaction with these guys was being held up at gunpoint, could have been killed. I'm not really so wanting to volunteer and go meet these people because they may be compromised and they just want to see what do you know. And then, you know, I'm going to their part, um, whatever their, you know, obviously their facility and what they have control of, I could, they could easily make me disappear. And that's what was going through my head. So I was not very like ready to go per se. You know, I had answers that I needed uh, or questions that I needed answered. So I sat on that number for about a day. And um, I finally texted, I called him, there was no voicemail, um, so I sent him a text message. He introduces himself, at least doesn't give me his name or anything like that. Um, but then he tells me, you know, exactly what I saw. He says he has documentation for me. He has, um, he wants to tell me everything that was related to what I witnessed and why. He gave me his background, so I went and flew out west. I met with this gentleman and some others. Um, you know, they picked me up in an armored vehicle that was, you know, pretty badass, to tell you the truth. Uh, Denali, that was bomb-proof, explosive-proof, everything. So they took my safety very serious. And then when we went to our rendezvous where we met at, first thing he does is he says, are you a 1911 guy or are you a Glock guy? I said, well, I like 1911s. I kind of had a uh, exper bad experience with one. So, like, I like Glocks. So he takes out a Glock, clears it, puts a slide back, hands it to me, and tells me to go ahead and load a magazine into it, chamber around, and put it on your hip. This was before meeting with them. So I was the only one armed, um, more for my reassurances 
um, because here I am meeting with these guys. And they understood that I was very apprehensive. So they're trying to make me feel comfortable um, security wise, just trying to, you know, relay the information. So they had this thing that looked like a wand. So it was like a silver box and it had like this antenna that looped around. So he puts it on himself like this. And then he hands it to me and says, go ahead and do the same thing. I have my phone in my pocket. So when I'm going over my ankles, my legs, and it goes over my phone and it hits a signal. And he says, is that your phone? I said, yes, it is. He says, go ahead and put it on airplane mode and set it to the side. Keep it out of your view or you're out of your, you know, area. Just put it off over the side over here. And uh, so I continue scanning and nothing else popped up. And I guess what that was for was to check for uh, transmitters, bugs, chips, things like that. And um, just to make sure that I was actually who I said. So these guys vetted me too. They know everything about me already. They've looked into my background. They've looked into my military records. They've looked into everything because these guys have that capability. Can I interrupt you? Just I have to ask you one question yes. because that's a fascinating idea that they scanned you for, you know, devices that somebody could be spying on them. Uh, have did you get any um, hint that people have tried to spy on them before? All the time. All Do you the have time. any idea who tries to spy on these secret programs? Um, I mean, it's counterintelligence for different countries, and it's more of a sense of wanting them, you know, not on the ET issue or the reverse engineered issue. This is more just kind of more what does the United States have in their pocket that they're trying to come up with that's very sophisticated? And this can range from weapon systems to even the NGAD, which is the newest plane, uh, sixth generation fighter that's about to come out. You know, so there's some speculation that maybe these guys, because they they do work for some of these aerospace companies, they're contractors through them, but they're also a part of this organization that's broken off that was created in 1947. All right. So um, is there, it happens all the time. There's so the, the spies would be more for, you know, mundane technology, not necessarily the UFO stuff. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Correct. I mean, because it's still, to an extent, would provide an advantage for their country as, a, you know, let's say Russia decided to get their hands on something that they knew what we had as a conventional operation. They know everything about it now. Now they can uh, put deterrences to that that can make them safe or counter um, counter system. So if it's a high flying uh, spy plane, then maybe they put a weapon system up, you know, that can target these much more efficient. I mean, there's so many different things, but as the United States, we do the same thing to that too, to different countries. I mean, it happens all the time. So it's just like spy versus spy throughout the world. Do you think but, there is a spy versus spy with the UFO stuff? Oh yeah. Right. And the reason being is it's also um, not necessarily to the extent of what people think. It's more of like, okay, certain aerospace company has heard that there's a rumor that they have this technology. So what they do is they try to figure out what it is, try to come up with their own variation of it, or they even try to buy it. So right now, um, because of the imminent danger, um, we're not imminent danger, but the imminent domain that was supposed to be signed into this bill that was gutted not too long ago, imminent domain was supposed to be a part of that. Now it's not off the table yet because all it means is that they have to go through some red, uh, more red velvet rope and try to basically figure out another way to get that done. So it's not off the table yet and everybody thinks it is. It's not. There's some crazy stuff going behind the scenes that I wish I could tell everybody, but um, just know that there's some good people behind the scenes trying to make this stuff work. So there's an aerospace company that is actually trying to relinquish its NHI technology and its stuff associated with that and trying to sell it to another aerospace company. Okay, because, Ross has alluded to that. Uh, yeah. he, na he named that aerospace company. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that has been confirmed from my sources that have met with him. Um, these guys specifically have also met with Ross uh, and had talked to them and told him, you know, they showed them stuff about their crash retrieval operations that they do. Um, there's even speculation that some of these bases, for the matter, have teams that that's their purpose is basically to set up a perimeter of this area that they or this site. And that's what they, that's what their job is, is basically recovering downed aircraft. And it doesn't matter if it's a civilian aircraft, if it's experimental aircraft, or if it's ET, they do all of it. Okay. So, well, I did, I didn't mean to derail you. Okay. So you're, you're going into this secret site. Yes. So, after he briefs me, he tells me the history of how this organization started, which was bred from the National Security Act that President Truman signed at that time. It's ironic that he was a 33rd degree Mason. I'm a 32nd degree Mason. 
But it's ironic that he was a 33rd president and a 32nd degree Freemason. President Roosevelt before him was a 32nd and the 32nd president of the United States. So I thought the play in numbers was just a little interesting. So, but he was on the sign, basically what the biggest lie that human history has ever seen uh, um, around this issue, such as the National Security Act. So you had the Air Force, which was created. You had the CIA at the same time, which was created. And then you had this organization that was created. And the organization that was created, the purpose of it was to study this phenomena and also retrieve materials related to this issue as well and put their own scientists to it, um, study it, reverse engineer it, understand it. And that's what they've done since 1947. Now, this group, the knowledge that is that these people who signed everything into law to create this organization, which um, at the time you had Army Special Operations, which was starting to get become something and then you had air force that wanted their own version of it so they created something along those lines that segued from that organization handling this issue into what a lot of people are now associating with this joint special operations command so as a matter of fact some of the key people i've been talking to on a daily basis one of which is a well-known figure and that's all i'm going to say i'm not going to reveal his identity um but a lot of these guys that are in JSOC, these operators and some of these commanders have had tasks where they had to do crash retrievals of non-human intelligence. And that's something that's well known in that community. A lot of people participate in it. A lot of people don't think that's the case, but these guys happen to do this regularly. Yeah, John so, Stewart was recently talking about that. Yeah. So that is something that, you know, and, you know, speaking of John Stewart, that guy's been getting a lot of flack. Um, and I understand why. The thing that people need to understand about John, the thing they need to understand, understand about Dr. Greer is that the information that they come out and tell are from people like me. So they're not, they're sometimes they're not the people who have firsthand accounts. There have people that come to him. So John's taking a risk with his reputation by putting stuff out. I'm not in any way discrediting what he has put out, but I am in my own reasoning also not confirming what he's talking about. I simply do not know. I've got people who are in these organizations looking into that, what he released as a matter of fact. And they're working because these guys intertwine with everything. So they can pretty much figure out who said what and it can come back. So I'm waiting for that to see if there's any confirmation of what John has released on this gentleman's behalf who supposedly came to him. So I'm not ruling it out. I don't want anybody to think that, you know, this guy's bad because he's just relaying what he was told that somebody told him in confidence. Granted, this person could have been somebody who is just trying to stir the pot and have this information, which happens a lot, you know, so that's why they're also looking into this to make sure that John is not misused as well. So that's always a risk. Dr. Rear faces the same fate, unfortunately, as well, or anybody like Blue Elizondo, because there's people who come to him saying the same thing. Um, you know, so they kind of have to sift and vet people to make sure everything kind of has some corroboration, whether it's from the inside of what people have witnessed or if it's other people um, such as myself, who is just an incidental witness. None of my guys, guys have came forward, um, one of which sent a message to myself to relay to the Senate Intelligence Committee, as well as Dr. Rear, that he was not coming forward because he was in fear of his life and his military career is more important than what I'm doing right now. He's not a very big fan of me. Um, this was somebody I used to be close with, but as time has went on, we've kind of parted ways a little bit because they don't want to be attached to this, and I don't blame them. There's still a risk, you know, and frankly, I I can I can be touched at any point. It's kind of ironic that they try to put these whistleblower protections into law, but that doesn't help with anything in my physical safety. I have to take care of that, obviously, with stuff like that that I've got back there, right? Do you feel safer now that you've gone public? Um, well, I know they don't want me to make me, uh, make me a martyr for this, but also these guys in this organization have some pretty unique assets and have uh, some funding. So I am being surveyed by these guys. They are helping with my security, um, as well as the federal government in certain ways. Um, I've had harassment from helicopters. Literally, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen as far as them harassing my dad, uh, harassing myself when me and my wife were home. They literally like to hover over 20, 30 feet over our house and rattle the walls and shake everything and then fly off. So they gave me applications to actually look through my phone with the camera function and it relays to you what agency has it, what the uh, call sign, or not call sign, but just all the information that the FAA would have on that particular aircraft, you could see that. 
But the problem is, is when you hit a ghost aircraft like that with this kind of app, nothing happens. So that's how you know it's a ghost ship. So every time I've had this instance happen, I've had help with one of these prominent people that everybody knows who's also a public figure on this issue. Um, he's gotten me in touch with Homeland Security. So every time I have something like this happen, I relay the information to them. Excuse me. And they look into it. And, and do they take it seriously? Do they do anything about it? Yeah. I met with these guys too. Um, some of them are also part of a human trafficking task force for um, Homeland Security. So I briefed them kind of what I briefed everybody else on, at least what I've learned from these insiders. So um, at some point, these guys may get in front of some of these people that have been telling me this information on the back end so they have a better understanding. But a lot of these people don't understand what they're up against until they find out what they're up against. Then they tuck their tail tails between their legs and they don't want anything to do with it or they try to figure out a way to get around it. But you have an organization that literally has the most sophisticated technologies based off of non-human intelligence that literally can do everything that they want. They've got their own Navy. They've got their own Air Force. They've got their own funding mechanism. They've got their own people. They've got their own politicians. They've got their own assets. And they're woven into every single industry that you can think of on the globe. So a lot of people have heard, I've heard since I've came out with this stuff, uh, with this information from these insiders. And some people are like, oh, they could take over the world. They already have. They already have. They already are well ahead of the curve of everybody else. What do you think? A lot of the, I mean, we're seeing a lot of the corruption play in Washington, D.C. This organization has, to an extent, some involvement with that. Maybe not the ET or the UFO issue, but still with their, their power and what they have, they're able to do it. They have people in law enforcement agencies, both federal, state, and local. They've got people in media. They've obviously got people on Capitol Hill. They've got people in the Pentagon. They've got people in the military. They've got people everywhere. Hollywood, as a matter of fact, too. Entrepreneurs even, you know, so they have a wide span of people that, you know, it's a small organization, but in a global capacity, it's enough to at least do or to get done what they've been doing keeping things secret, having key people in this organization that also happen to be in key positions of power. So when their something is brought to their attention, they can personally swoop it under the rug and they can tell the person who brought that complaint up, oh yeah, we looked into it, but it was nothing. So that's how this, that's how a lot of this information actually gets swept under the rug is because of involvement like that. And that's why it's risky for these guys as much as they would love to tell humanity the stuff that's been going on. These guys are in that organization. It's very easy to figure out who said what if there's a specific location, their name, everything that's associated with what I've been talking about comes to back to these people. They could easily be targeted as well as their families, and they are not risking that. Not only that, but they've seen the blowback Grush has gotten, defamation, I mean, especially as myself as well. They don't want to be in the spotlight. They don't care anything like that. What they want is to get the truth out. So now that... This organization since 1947 has been dealing with this. They started pulling people from Joint Special Operations Command. And what they were doing is they have, I'm not going to go through the exact assessment that they do, because I don't know if it's only a specific group of people they do this with, but I will tell you, they do some stuff that um, replicates a stress test to see if they're cognitive and able to think under pressure like that. They have a uh, personality traits that they also analyze too. If you're a sociopathic or psych psychopathic, then they basically can groom you into doing some of these operations that are not favorable by people who have morals, integrity, and want to do the right thing. Because what happened was a lot of people in this organization, there's good guys. There's a lot of good people in this organization that were misled. But the problem is, is now that they're aware of what's going on, they don't know how to get out. They can't just walk out the door and say, hey, guys, I quit. I'm retiring, whatever it is, that's not how it works. They, If they do quit or they retire and they have knowledge of this, they're still surveyed. Their phones are tapped. They're chipped. A lot of these guys I talk to, they actually happen to be chipped. So um, they have it in the middle of their back and it points up to the sky and it's also very hard to reach. Um, so satellites can pick that up, but that's where it usually is, is in the middle of their back. So. Is it just a tracker? Uh, there's some that are trackers, but some of them also register biological data, heartbeats, you know, everything like that. Your, your, you know, vital signs, things like that. Your bio, anything on your biological data. I don't know the extent of it, but that's what I was told that a lot of the stuff happens like that. And the guys that I talked to specifically, they are chipped, but they're chipped by their own group. 
because there's a, you know, what they've expressed to me, they've told the same thing to some other people that I know very well that are in this issue, is that there is a war going on in that organization with these groups, the bad guys versus the good guys. It's good versus evil for the most part. The good guys want the technology so they can give it to the public and humanity can go on to this upward swing of being more consciously adept and being more thriving as a society and not on the decline that we happen to be. The decline is by these bad people who are seizing these politicians or trying to you know, go behind the scenes. So when people say that there's a secret government, yes, there is. But this organization in itself with this technology happens to be more of the enforcement part of that organization. It's almost like a department, like it's almost like a police department of that organization where they have unlimited funding, unlimited assets. They can track anybody. They can do anything they want. Then they have the political side of it, which is politicians that are bought into this. Then they have the oil, gas, coal. They have everything integrated into their thing, um, basically funneling all this money in and paying these people basically either go along with their plan or they either threaten to kill them or they actually end up killing so you know majority of the guys though at least in these programs that were from these aerospace companies that are in this organization they're misled so right now what they're trying to figure out is how to get out and that's so, who's been working with you is this pro disclosure group yes mm -hmm. okay okay so you know they're, they're good guys i mean on a personal note they're they're fantastic people they served our country very well when they were uniform military i'm not going to go into specifics where, where they went to or what i think a lot of people can probably put that together with stuff that's been coming out but um i kind of feel my sense as a person who's been helped by these guys that maybe i can help them in return and, and get some favors done for them personally to see if they can actually get through the good part of the government if there's politicians that are actually interested in this, that actually care about these people. Because without people like, like them in our, in our circle helping us, we don't have a leg to stand on. I would have never known what I experienced and what the purpose of it was. I would have known and not known anything like that. It's very rare that you have somebody who comes forward with a story like this, that they've witnessed something, but then you have the guys that are actually doing it also come in support of what I've been saying. And giving me the reasons of what I experienced and why. And uh, do I agree with it? I really don't. But, you know, um, do, do I understand how it operates and how it works? 100%. You know, but I don't agree with it. I think there's better ways that this can be approached. So these containers that I saw, they usually house refugees. These refugees are screened from different parts of the world, such as third world countries. And the other organization is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's another uh, source for them to pluck people from that have this what they call psionic uh, potential predisposition or p3 is what they dub it that is a screening program to basically see if these people have the psychic abilities which there's people who have some pretty crazy abilities i've never met anybody personally but apparently this is a real thing because these guys spend billions of dollars with the stuff that they research and what they've done based off these people and the reason is, is because these operators who run these programs are not at the level that these people are consciously. So what they use these people, they bring them from these third world countries where they won't be missed. They'll also be more able and willing to actually want to help with the projects and research that they're doing compared to staying at a, a war-torn country or something that's very poor. They want the better lifestyle, so they usually most of the time will side with these this organization. They're very well taken care of. All their necessities are met. They are, you know, housed, they're medical, their children are taught in schools, you know, they get educated, things like that. So they can live somewhat a normal life, but they're not able to live a full life like we're able to. They're stuck. They're all chipped as well. They're all have people that are kept tabs, you know, so they have the understanding consciously that that is something that extraterrestrials are very highly evolved consciously as well. So they need people that are also on a similar level, not nearly as much as an ET would be, at least my assumption. But what they use these people for is to connect to that technology. So you need to think of it this way, like this is a black team operator or supervisor, whoever it is, somebody who's not at that level, you have this machine that plugs into person B, which is the psionic, which then has the machine on them, and then they plug into whatever technology, such as a craft, any kind of other technologies that um, are with NHI, they can connect to it on their own accord. 
without having to go into meditation. Uh, what they also do is put them in a, a state of, I don't want to say psychosis, but it's something that basically they flood them with these serotonin, uh, you know, uh, drugs that affect their consciousness, but it allows them to be very elevated. But the problem with these drugs is they're pushed at such an extreme amount that in conjunction with the machinery that they're hooked up to, a lot of them pass away over time. It's not, some people used to go instantly. They flood them with these drugs, hook them to this machine and uh, they would die. Best case, they go into a coma. But throughout the years, they've actually done some research and actually have made uh, progressive movements in place to actually get people who are, I don't know what their threshold is per se, but they're able to handle it. So essentially what they also use these people for is they will take them out to a site. I've seen one of the sites that they go to and I was taken to this black site and they have very advanced EMP scalar longitudinal weapon systems that they deploy to the surface because this is an underground facility. And what they end up doing is there's a couple of functions. One, they rack test, um, they rack test weapon technologies at these places, radar cross-section technologies, um, as well as propulsion systems. They also rack test to these facilities. But what they also do is they get these P3s, put them up to the surface, and they have them over time make contact and literally summon extraterrestrial technologies or NHI craft that can fully materialize or they, you know, they can, what these guys told me, because they see this happen a couple times a year, two to three times a year, they're shooting down ET craft at this location. And they say in, in our spectrum, just our normal sight, they look like orbs. When you have thermal or you have night vision goggles, you can actually see the full shape of these craft. You can but see what Why do the NHIs keep on coming if they keep on getting shot down? So they actually have these P3s that are building rapport with them. Like they don't shoot them down instantly. They, this happens where they build up their trust and everything over time. And these P3s don't know that there's this other group out there with these weapons, by the way. They just think that they're coming out. I don't know the specifics. I do know that they that some of the similar containers that I saw, they still use those. They still bring them up to the surface and truck them to wherever they need to be trucked to at these secured areas, and that's when they make contact. So think of like a CE5 event, but something that's more um, for sure, something that's more like if this was to happen, you would no shit see a craft materialize. And they've told me instances where they've had these guys contact some races that have what looks like ginormous black pyramid craft that have appeared. They're huge. I don't know if they've ever taken any of those down, but I know that they've taken some other smaller craft down that are maybe not at that level. But um, and some of these guys are a part of this team that actually does the crash retrieval operations. So they told me all about how they do that. Um, which is not by any means, I'm not a fan of knowing, but I understand that they're kind of doing this without, you know, they have to, or some stuff could happen, but it's not, I don't think it's beneficial that we keep targeting species for the matter that could be hostile to some extent, because we never came across with, with every single race out there. But maybe all of a sudden we end up doing that one time and they're not a big fan of us and they decide to retaliate. What I will also tell you that I just found out within the last couple of days, in the crash retrieval world and operation of NHI, it is normal to have people get zapped by a craft when it's down. Did you say sapped? Zapped. Zapped. Zapped by a craft. Lethally or... Um, I have not been confirmed that it is lethal, but I'm assuming that, yes, that there has been cases of that. I did also learn about an event that happened in 1978 that was a kinetic event between NHIs being held at a facility and um, this group. So okay, there... well, Michael, my mind is blowing here. Okay, I've got a thousand questions. You. I don't want to stop the flood of information, but I want to pick apart what you've already given. Okay, um, go ahead. Okay, so, well, okay, all right, so they're baiting NHIs in to be shot down. 
Now, if they're able to establish a connection and a relationship with these beings uh, to entice them in, that that would kind of suggest that they're not overtly evil. You know, you can you can yeah. have a so we might be shooting at some good guys. Yes. Um, you know, do you have any information on who we're shooting at and and why we chose them to shoot at? So, Is it just we just we want their tech? For the most part, for this organization, wants their tech. There's only two species I'm aware of that they have actually shot down and that is uh grays that are the normal grays that everybody sees and then they have some that are actually taller um you know what let me actually pull up the message because uh like i said i've got this on communications and it's i wish you were a fly on the wall of this thread you know what i mean because oh uh, yeah me too man <laughs> yeah because I, there's times where i'm sitting watching these guys talk and it's like Wow, like, and this is normal to them. This isn't just something that's like, oh, here we go. He says, under the grays, we have recovered main types, large and small. One has organic anatomy, and the other is a biological android of some sort, so we believe. Okay, that's typically what you hear about the, the small grays. Mm -hmm. And any information on the taller one? Are they the tall grays? Are they human-looking? Do you have any? Just the regular grays, as far as what they look, they said that they talked about the irony of how the description actually fits what people see. Okay. So, um, but yeah, it's the typical grays that people, for the most part, I've never seen a gray, so I don't know what, you know, what I, I can only go off of X files or movies that people put out. Maybe, okay, that's probably accurate, but I've never seen a gray in person. Do you have any information about historical accounts of, you know, uh, you know, J-Rod or, you know, EB-1 or, you know, the, the uh, recovered grays or beings that are uh, said to have been uh, taken from retrieved crashes and kept alive for a certain amount of time. Do you have any information yes. on, on that? Um, that actually does happen quite a bit. And it's not just, you know, um, it's not just grays. I mean, but like I said, the accounts that I know, especially the one that happened in 1978, which ended up being a kinetic engagement, meaning that people died. Um so the, the ruling that NHI, NHI could be protecting itself from us. I don't blame them 100% and they need to do whatever they can to survive. To me, that doesn't really seem like it's hostile. To me, it's like somebody coming and starting a fight with you or trying to rob you. You happen to be armed and you take them out and, you know, you're defending yourself. I kind of view it the same way that maybe these ETs are doing. So for people to say that they're hostile, yeah, they could be. There could be a point to where we've triggered something with them that they're not big fans of us and they want to get the hell out of here. But the fact that there's been events, especially this 1978 event, where NHI has been held captive. And this isn't just the, this one event. This happens a lot. At this specific site that I went to, they have NHI technology and they have bodies there. I don't know if they have live NHI there, but I know they have bodies at this facility. But you said you haven't seen any beings. No, I know for a fact they have them there based mm -hmm. off of what information they've given me. Um, because I don't doubt it. You hear that all the time, you know. Yep. Uh, and I don't know the specifics as such as the races. They said that there's some grays, but I mean, it could be, I mean, there, I mean, there's so many races. I mean, just like, just like the human race. I mean, there's so many different variations of human being. There's got to be something with these guys too, you know, so it's not, it's not impossible, you know, but it's weird to sit here and talk to guys that do this on a regular basis. And it's just a normal day in the office to them. And for us, it's like, what are you doing? Like everybody wants to see it. You know, and I think people should see it. I think people should understand that, you know, if we have humans that are able to connect to ETs like that without meditation, I mean, wouldn't we want to have people like that? Like maybe a panel of psionic assets that sit there with the government and actually can probably form plans with extra races that. Right, right. Well, why to... aren't we establishing good relationships with the beings instead of shooting them down? I don't understand that. I mean, well, why would you start something that, you know, you're, you're dealing with beings that have this high tech, you know, if you if you are. I mean, it kind of shows that we're not it kind of shows that we're aware that they're not hostile, because if we were shooting at these advanced beings with this high tech and we were aware that they were hostile, obviously we would expect a hostile response. Uh, um, so, I mean, so we're like knowingly shooting at non hostile uh, advanced beings. It sounds like. Uh, and I my, understanding, my understanding is that you know the psionics that they're building a rapport essentially maybe and, you know that because they have re referenced to me that you know what if nothing happens of this this disclosure for example well one the skies are not classified so people will still see things going up in the sky 
And they always encourage people to look up, including myself, right? Because who knows, you may look out one night and see something that you'll never forget. And hopefully it's a more positive experience compared to what I saw. Hopefully it doesn't involve something to that magnitude, but something where people can confirm to them. Yeah, okay, well, that's not normal. Maybe that is NHI. Maybe it's something that's positive. And I understand that there's more than our, more than ourselves on this planet. So the other thing that they've mentioned is that these psionics are also, they could be the saving grace because they typically have good relationships with these ETs. So um, that could be something that maybe because of the relationships and this doesn't go anywhere, that it may also follow suit for NHI intervention at some point. And from what I've been told, that is not far off the map either. They've had instances where they, they have these P3s talking about um, some sort of intervention. Any, now, I don't know this. On... I don't know the specifics of it. I don't know the timeline of it, but I'm well aware, and some of these guys are well aware that this is a natural, this is the occurrence that these P3s have. Once they make a connection with these beings, it doesn't go away. They can choose to partake in the connection or things like that. But over time, they develop this relationship. And then unfortunately, one of the times when nobody, you know, these P3s are probably talking to their friends and there's this organization off in the distance with these EMPs and they decide to shoot them down. So I imagine that I don't know if they rotate these people in and out, because if I was to be something where I'm in a program and this is just my point of view and I have this ability and I all of a sudden make contact with a being that you end up coming very close with spiritually. Right. And you end up, you know, becoming really good friends with this other species you're like oh my god i can't believe it you feel good about it and then all of a sudden you see their craft get destroyed get knocked out of the sky what does that do to the the poor person that's what i'm saying and the demographic of people in these programs that are these psionics this is the trait that they've noticed screening these people is they happen to be children women and gay men left-handed women more specifically have this ability and that's typically the trait and then as well as gay men too so um, I don't know that that just happens to be the screening process of, of what they've countered with this, the demographic of people, but that's what they have suggested that that's the most common type of people that they run into that are these refugees. So um, that, dovetails with, that, that dovetails with my research into the spiritual and people that have abilities and mediums, et cetera, often tend to be women. Uh, you know, some people think it has to do with the right brain, left brain, uh, intuitive versus uh, logic, uh, you know, part of the brains. I don't know. I'm, I'm the same boat. I don't know how this works either. I will tell everybody uh, sometime in the near future, it was supposed to happen last year, but they never got to it. Um, but now that they've actually had confirmed a set date for coming up in springtime, I will have a chance to meet with one of these P3s personally and actually watch this happen. That's and okay. But not the shooting down part, hopefully. Uh, I told them that if there's any of that instance happening, I do not want to witness it. I do not want to see anything like that. Um, I want to see peaceful approach. I it, it would put I would probably go into a frenzy if I was to see something like that. Why that, aren't they establishing relationships with these beings instead of shooting at them? Well, it's power and greed. I mean, these guys have the most powerful technology and they weaponize it for their own purposes. I mean, if we were to have something like that, it'd be like, okay, what's it going to make for our life to be easier with that technology? For them, they want to have the power and control of the human population with this technology because they can do whatever they want with it. And they have, you know, they're, they're, that's pretty much all it is, is greed, corruption, and control and power are all these people care about. And I'm talking about these handlers that, you know, know all of this stuff that manage these programs. The people below them, they're more the patriotic, oh, I thought I was doing something good for this country, but they were being misused and lied to in order to help, you know, reverse engineer research, development, everything like that. And now they're, they're being woken up to the idea that they're being used in a very nefarious way that doesn't sit well with them. So the people that have this realization because of the word going around, now they're trying to figure out an exit strategy. And unfortunately, these guys make a lot of money. They make a lot of money doing what they do. And, you know, for them to lose this job and lose the lifestyles that they've had because they make a lot of money and they're taking care of their families, I don't blame them one bit having that apprehension to just want to pick up and go somewhere and, and one, go to a job that's not going to make you as much money. But two, they have to understand that money cannot be the route that chooses them to motivate them to do the right thing. It shouldn't because it's the exact opposite with these guys too, using the money to do the bad stuff too. And in my view, 
there's a similarity between these two people. Doesn't matter what you're using the money for. You're still letting the ma money manifestation rule your decision making to do the right or the wrong thing. You're just trying to choose a spectrum of that. So they really need to figure out what they what they do. I know they'll watch this video because they'll send it to me and tell me what I did good. And, and usually I tell them um, if I can get any kind of feedback. So I know. Oh, that OK, well, I'm just going to put a shout out to those guys. All right. You know, to, to even you know the, the bad guys that are watching this, you know, if there are any. Uh, you know, just think how much more money and power you could get opening up a trade vectors with other civilizations. Um, imagine a trade exchange or something like that. Imagine a monetary benefit uh, to open contact. Imagine how much, how many riches that would bring, uh, as opposed to shooting at them and scavenging for parts. Right. Uh, well, just a thought. Well, in the knowledge aspect of it too, and you're, if you have people that are higher consciously more adept you're gonna have a lot more smarter people which you have a lot more smarter people means you're gonna have a lot more peaceful people because typically the correlation between intelligence and high consciousness with high technologies is that they don't have the lower vibrations of wanting to murder wanting to pillage wanting to destroy they don't want any of that right they kind of more in a sense it's almost like them walking past a civilization of ants on the sidewalk for example they don't do anything okay there's some ants cool just walking by but then you have the people that also happen to be the bad guys that may, you know, such as this control group that has a magnifying glass that likes to go over to these ants and zap them, right? So that's kind of the mentality of it. And obviously, they're not going to have nearly the same understanding that high uh, intelligence beings such as NHI or even these P3s would be, you know, so there's a disconnect. And I know that they're trying to figure out the connection to actually get something positive to happen through all of this instead of happening, you know, having the negative course of this, which could potentially destroy our entire planet. And it's yeah, not that, that terrifies me that we could be antagonizing, uh, even if they're not overtly hostile, if we keep on shooting at them, they could become hostile. Exactly. I mean, it's the way I see it. You know, I've, I've driven a lot of supercars. I've got some pretty fast cars. That's my thing. I'm a, I'm a gearhead, you know, so um, and a lot of my money goes towards cars. That's just how it is. <laughs> You know, I like going fast. I like having 850 horsepower cars, you know, especially cars that people have a heart. They think that they can't afford them. But if you do a good business and you know how to do business, then that's the whole reason why I got businesses to fund my car collection and shit. But my dad um, was a car yeah. guy, too. Yeah. yeah. But it'd be no different for me going to a neighborhood, you know, that is full of poor people, for example, and they have a gun and decide to kill me and take my car. That's how I view this. That's no different. It's maybe with a different type of uh, situation, such as the weapon systems, but the nature is still the same. It's still for material possession because they have things that we don't, you know. So now that they have the technologies which can do circles over our most sophisticated weapons that we have as far as a conventional government that people know about, including these black programs, then um, what's going to stop them? You know, one of the things I ask these guys is, Okay, if you're if you're testing these weapons against your own created technologies, which by the way um, they have far more advanced stuff than just flying stuff. They have said multiple times that flying is boring; it's just transportation. But everybody's so enamored with the UFO aspect that they have way advanced other stuff. The only other thing I know about is the weapon systems that they have and how that works. But as far as the other stuff, I don't know. My speculation would be like medical technology, because let's say for example, you need a you need a heart transplant. Well, instead of using, waiting for a donor, somebody has the perfect uh, criteria to be a donor for you, excuse me, they could probably just grow something like that with this kind of technology. Replicate your good heart that you have and literally replace it. And you don't have to have a donor. You don't have to have somebody die for your heart. You know, they can do this with limbs. They can do this with a brain. They can do this with anything. That kind of technology. And some of these guys have confirmed some bit of stuff with medical technology, but not nearly to the degree because that's not that's not their department. But they've had some other fundamental breakthroughs they've had through technologies that involve stuff with medical technologies, which is insane because if that was to come out, they pretty much can cure illnesses and cancers that same way too, which means humans would live longer, be happier, be healthier. We'd have stuff that helps the environment per se, because then you have technologies that help, and you know, not that there's, you know, pollution is a bad thing, but it's not nearly the degree that everybody thinks it is, but it's still enough to make an effect on the ecosystem. So if we are actually helping mother earth with this technology, 
then it means that we get to elevate this entire planet as a whole, which means that who knows, maybe we will be allowed to venture out into space and join some of these civilizations and see what they li their life is like on their own star systems and planets. The other thing that I will say is they have a hard time figuring out what's interdimensional as well as extraterrestrial. Extraterrestrial is beings that are from a different star system in our universe. Interdimensional means that these guys come from a different universe but know how to tap in and out. Now, the thing with NHI is they know how to basically go through interdimensionally as well as linear through space time, how our present universe is, but they can go through interdimensional too. So they can kind of tap into both worlds. So there's been some talks in Capitol Hill, the differences between both of those. And right can, now- Can our vehicles or their, the control group's vehicles, can they go interdimensionally? I don't know um, firsthand. That's actually one of my questions I have for some of these guys when I meet up with them again is figure out if they actually had cracked the code to that. Because what I'm assuming is, is if if they have the means to replicate the same technology almost on par with what NHI is doing, then I'm I would bet for a fact that maybe they know how to do it, but they probably if they if they could, they probably already have. They probably just don't know. But I wouldn't rule it out. You know, um some of these guys have said that they've had craft go out into space and come back into our atmosphere, you know, so some of these guys went out into space, not the people I'm talking to, but just the organization and whole house, you know, so they've had other people. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think that this is a no normal day to them. And for us, it's the most miraculous, most, uh, you know, uh, exciting thing in our history, you know, so in them, they're bored of it, you know. So but, but, but no idea how far out they've gone. Nope. I want to get bored of, of flying in space. That, that, that's my dream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is my seventh time around the sun. I mean, right, right. Let's yeah, go well, to a binary system. See how that works. Uh, so you're saying uh, Congress? So they you, uh, they had gone to Congress with this information? Is that what you? Uh, I think I, 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 I cut you to... off as you were as you were getting to Congress. No, you're, you're good. You're good. But yes, yeah, some of them have went to the Senate Intelligence Committee, Special Intelligence Services. They've had their information relayed to some pol politicians. Um, but these guys are disappointed. The fact of, you know, these guys are turning this into a political scheme like they always do. You know, they're trying to make it about politics. And that's where this becomes a problem. If they don't have a politics, this can get resolved pretty much easy because everybody would be on board with this. And they should be. You have some pretty important people who literally can break open this charade single handedly and literally take these people to some of these installations or these black sites and show them everything they've got there. And it would prove to the world that everything is legitimate and that they have exactly what everybody thinks that they have, you know? So, but the fact is, and then re relaying this information to Arrow, for example, they don't want any part of that. Some that's, of these guys- That's are, insane that the government's it? it blows my UFO mind. program isn't even interested. I'm, it's not insane because of force- they're not interested because they're part of the cover-up. But, you know, if we if we thought they were legitimate, that would be insane. Yeah, and you know what? I mean, if if I was a part of that organization, okay, we got the coordinates to this location. Okay, who do we have as an asset there that we can talk to? Because then what happens is obviously they're going to have some resistance towards that aspect of it because you have the bad guys who want to keep this under, under wraps. But I think what happens is if they were to strategize something more like a public thing to say, okay, well, here's a group of politicians going to this installation here. They're not going to say where it's at just yet. But if the public knows about that and all of a sudden they come back, whether somebody is killed or anything like that, that would put a red flag over this entire operation to get everybody's knowledge because the fact is, is why was somebody killed to begin with if they're going to go look at something? That would confirm to everybody that they stumbled onto something they shouldn't have. So then citizens such as the taxpayers here, which you're still suffering it because people are paying for this unknowingly and they're paying for psychopaths to be in power. But then you have the people that are bought by these aerospace companies also sweeping it under the rug. So that's the thing that I always encourage people and I always tell people, follow the money. You see where people are taking money from these aerospace companies and there's ways you can look online. I don't know the specifics of it. I just know the 12 people that actually are paid by these companies and there's a list about to be released here soon in conjunction with some other stuff that's going to blow uh, these guys out of the water and say, okay, well, if you want to continue your career in politics, do the right thing. Because if people see this list of politicians that come out, my advice to you guys, vote them the hell out. 
They are not doing anything positive for us as the American people. They are caring about their pocketbooks, what they get paid. It only costs a couple hundred grand to buy a congressman and a couple million to buy a senator. Just remember that. So, you know, and the joke is going like maybe we can give them uh, NASCAR jackets like these uh, NASCAR drivers have because you see all their sponsors and stuff like that. Maybe we can do the same thing to these Congress and senators. <laughs> that way we know who's got, who's in our pocket, right? I love it. You know, but that's what it really comes down to. And, they, you know, hearing from some people who sit in these offices on day, and even in D.C. acknowledge that there is, in fact, a uniparty is also disappointing. All they care about is the money aspect. They just like the quote unquote illusion of power that they have. I call but it the I mean, establishment because it almost doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the historical the hysterical thing is, is now that this establishment knows that there's something that's not even making that these guys aren't making the decisions unless it's the lower end decisions that, you know, not really the important stuff. It's almost like your dad telling you, OK, go ahead and drop off this car over here, but you're not going to run my shop. You know what I mean? Like you're just letting you do tasks. It's kind of the same thing with these politicians. So, you know, it, it's 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 disheartening to say that because you think that these guys would want the best for us as a country. But the first thing that comes into their mind is dollar bills. And that is their, that's all they care about. And the reason why this issue is secret and the reason why people are being killed is because of that, because of the power, the greed and corruption. I can't say it enough, but it's the absolute truth. And if us as a human species didn't have a price tag on every single person, we'd be far along with this because we would get what we actually need, not what we want. And what we need is to be elevated. So um, my mission for this is to blow this out of the water with the help of these guys and maybe something will come of this here soon and um, there's some stuff i wish i could tell you and as well as you jack but your viewers that um there's some stuff going on behind the scenes that is supposed to get this resolved is this the raking over the furniture that lou elizondo promised part of that yeah that's you know, are you part of that effort uh, I can't confirm or deny that. I will, <laughs> okay. I will tell you, I know that it's the knowledge of it is real. There are people who are trying to put other things in place so it can work on behalf of knowledge of others who need this to happen, as well as coordinated efforts between other parties, if you will. Uh, I'm not going to get into specifics, but there's some stuff working, and hopefully it does happen soon because this needs to help us. You know, um, what else do I want to say? The 25 year approach, I think is horrible. I think it's something that should be, hey, you guys have 60 days to sign this uh, over to these officials and start having these agencies go through. Because the other aspect I want people to think about, let's say that we actually do accomplish our objective with this coming out. Think about the after effect. Who do we have that can manage that in the government that knows nothing about this technology? As far as they know, it doesn't exist. So when this does come out, you have to appoint people who may not know what they're doing with this. Or it gets swept into a black program again, but still has oversight of it. But then you have possibly the repeat of what's going on. So it's a very tricky situation that if all of this is relinquished over, they're still going to have to do something with it. And they're still going to have to appoint the right people. So the question that they have, and this is what I've had, is that if this does happen, are they going to allow the aerospace companies to keep it, but they have politicians breathing down their neck? But again, all they got to do is pull out a stack of cash out of their suit, hand it to so-and-so that's on Capitol Hill. You didn't see anything here. And here's more of that if you uh, play ball with us. You know, that's the other risk, too. So it's just coming to uh, an after effect that's actually going to be beneficial to everybody, I think, needs to be considered because everybody's thinking about okay we need this to come out we need this to come out well yes we do but how do we actually manage it when it's out i hope you enjoyed part one of my two-part interview with michael herrera he had some amazing information for us uh, be sure to stay tuned tomorrow for part two where he has some even more amazing information for us uh, about psionics and everything else. It's going to be gangbusters. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Meanwhile, if you've enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up and give Mike a big thumbs up. Uh, please hit subscribe and the bell to be notified of future videos. You don't want to miss a thing. 
And join me on social media, Facebook and Twitter links below. Love to see you guys there. If you wanted to support Cosmic Road in a bigger way, please consider grabbing a coffee mug or a t-shirt in the merch store below. And I'll see you guys next time. This is Jack with Cosmic Road, signing out. Thank you